दर्शक ब्रेन फिर पी स्वागत अठारो रिच डैड पोर डैड लेसन को रिडिंग एंड लिस्निंग प्रोग्राम में हियर वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट अगेन द एटीन थे एपिशोड अफ रिच डैड पोर डैड प्रोग्राम लर्निंग एंड लिस्निंग प्रोग्राम हियर वी आर गोइंग टू स्टार्ट हियर लेट्स बिगिन आवर प्रोग्राम It reminds me of the story of the guy sitting with firewood in his arms on a cold freezing night and he is yelling at the pot-bellied stove when you give me some heat then I'll put some wood in and when it comes to money love happiness sales and contacts all one needs to remember is first to give what you want and it will come back in droves often just the process of thinking of what I want and how could I give what I want to someone else breaks free a torrent of bounty Whenever I feel that people aren't smiling at me, I simply begin smiling and saying hello, and like magic, there are suddenly more smiling people around me. It is true that your world is only a mirror of you. So that's why I say, teach and you shall receive. I have found that the more I sincerely teach those who want to learn, come back or what I have teachers, and he became a master teacher. My rich dad always taught young people his way of doing business. In retrospect, It was their generosity with what they knew that made them smarter. There are powers in this world that are much smarter than we are. You can get there on your own, but it's easier with the help of the powers that be. All you need to be is generous with what you have, and the powers will be generous with you. Chapter 10. Still want more? Here are some to-dos. Many people may not be satisfied with my 10 steps. They see them more as philosophies than actions. I think understanding the philosophy is just as important as the action. There are many people who want to do instead of think, and then there are people who think but do not do. I would say that I am both. I love new ideas. In other words, take a break and assess what is working and what is not working. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Stop doing what is not working and look for something new to do. Look for new ideas. For new investing ideas, I go to bookstores and look for books on different and unique subjects. I call them formulas. I buy how to books on a formula I know nothing about. For example, it was in the bookstore that I found the book The 16% Solution by Joel Moskowitz. I bought the book and read it. Take action. The next Thursday, I did exactly as the book said, step by step. I have also done that with finding real estate bargains in attorneys offices and in banks. Most people do not take action or they let someone talk them out of whatever new formula they are studying. My neighbor told me why 16% would not work. I did not listen to him because he's never done it. Find someone who has done what you want to do. Take them to lunch. Ask them for tips for little tricks of the trade. As for 16% tax lien certificates, I went to the county tax office and found the government employee who worked in the office. I found out that she, too, invested in the tax liens. Immediately, she was invited to lunch. She was thrilled to tell me everything she knew and how to do it. After lunch, she spent all afternoon showing me everything. By the next day, I found two great properties with her help and have been accruing interest at 16% ever since. It took a day to read the book. A day to take action, an hour for lunch, and a day to acquire two great deals. Take classes and buy tapes. I search the newspapers for new and interesting classes. Many are for free or small fee. I also attend and pay for expensive seminars on what I want to learn. I am wealthy and free from needing a job simply because of the courses I took. I have friends who did not take those classes who told me I was wasting my money, and yet they're still at the same job. Make lots of offers. When I want a piece of real estate, I look at many properties and generally write an offer. If you don't know what the right offer is, neither do I. That is the job of the real estate agent. They make the offers. I do as little work as possible. A friend wanted me to show her how to buy apartment houses. So one Saturday she, her agent and I went and looked at six apartment houses. Four were dogs, but two were good. I said to write offers on all six, offering half of what the owners asked for. She and the agent nearly had heart attacks. They thought it would be rude, 
that I might offend the sellers, but I really don't think the agent wanted to work that hard. So they did nothing and went on looking for a better deal. No offers were ever made, and that person is still looking for the right deal at the right price. Well, you don't know what the right price is until you have a second party who wants to deal. Most sellers ask too much. It is rare that a seller will actually ask a price that is less than something is worth. Moral of the story, make offers. People who are not investors have no idea what it feels like to be trying to sell something. I have had a piece of real estate that I wanted to sell for months. I would have welcomed anything. I would not care how low the price. They could have offered me 10 pigs and I would have been happy. Not at the offer, but just because someone was interested. I would have countered, maybe for a pig farm in exchange. But that's how the game works. The game of buying and selling is fun. Keep that in mind. It's fun and only a game. Make offers. Someone might say yes. And I always make offers with escape clauses. In real estate, I make an offer with the words. Subject to approval of business partner. I never specify who the business partner is. Most people do not know my partner is my cat. If they accept the offer, and I don't want the deal, I call my home and speak to my cat. I make this absurd statement to illustrate how absurdly easy and simple the game is. So many people make things too difficult and take them too seriously. Finding a good deal, the right business, the right people, the right investors, or whatever is just like dating. You must go to the market and talk to a lot of people, make a lot of offers, counter offers, negotiate, reject and accept. I know single people who sit at home and wait for the phone to ring, but unless you're Cindy Crawford or Tom Cruise, I think you'd best go to the market, even if it's only the supermarket. Search, offer, reject, negotiate and accept are all parts of the process of almost everything in life. Jog, walk or drive a certain area once a month for 10 minutes. I have found some of my best real estate investments while jogging. I will jog a certain neighborhood for a year. What I look for is change. For there to be profit in a deal, there must be two elements, a bargain and change. There are lots of bargains, but it's change that turns a bargain into a profitable opportunity. So when I jog, I jog a neighborhood I might like to invest in. It is the repetition that causes me to notice slight differences. I notice real estate signs that are up for a long time. That means the seller might be more agreeable to deal. I watch for moving trucks, going in or out. I stop and talk to the drivers. I talk to the postal carriers. It's amazing how much information they acquire about an area. I find a bad area, especially an area that the news has scared everyone away from. I drive it for sometimes a year waiting for signs of something changing for the better. I talk to retailers, especially new ones, and find out why they're moving in. It takes only a few minutes a month, and I do it while doing something else, like exercising, or going to and from the store. As for stocks, I like Peter Lynch's book Beating the Street for his formula for selecting stocks that grow in value. I have found that the principles of finding value are the same regardless if it's real estate, stocks, mutual funds, new companies, a new pet, a new home, a new spouse, or a bargain on laundry detergent. The process is always the same. You need to know what you're looking for and then go look for it. Why consumers will always be poor. When the supermarket has a sale on, say, toilet paper, the consumer runs in and stocks up. When the stock market has a sale, most often called a crash or correction, the consumer runs away from it. When the supermarket raises its prices, the consumer shops elsewhere. When the stock market raises its prices, the consumer starts buying. Look in the right places. A neighbor bought a condominium for $100,000. I bought the identical condo next door to his for $50,000. He told me he's waiting for the price to go up. I told him that his profit is made when you buy, not when you sell. He shopped with a real estate broker who owns no property of their own. I shopped at the foreclosure department of a bank. I paid $500 for a class on how to do this. My neighbor thought that the $500 for a real estate investment class was too expensive. He said he could not afford it, and he couldn't afford the time. So he waits for the price to go up. 
I look for people who want to buy first, then I look for someone who wants to sell. A friend was looking for a certain piece of land. He had the money and did not have the time. I found a large piece of land larger than what my friend wanted to buy, tied it up with an option, called my friend and he wanted a piece of it. So I sold the piece to him and then bought the land. I kept the remaining land as mine for free. Moral of the story, buy the pie and cut it in pieces. Most people look for what they can afford, so they look too small. They buy only a piece of the pie, so they end up paying more for less. Small thinkers don't get the big breaks. If you want to get richer, think bigger first. Retailers love giving volume discounts, simply because most business people love big spenders. So even if you're small, you can always think big. When my company was in the market for computers, I called several friends and asked them if they were ready to buy also. We then went to different dealers and negotiated a great deal because we wanted to buy so many. I have done the same with stocks. Small people remain small because they think small. Act alone, or don't act all. Learn from history. All the big companies on the stock exchange started out as small companies. Colonel Sanders did not get rich until after he lost everything in his 60s. Bill Gates was one of the richest men in the world before he was 30. Action always beats inaction. These are just a few of the things I have done and continue to do to recognize opportunities. The important words being done and do as repeated many times throughout the book, you must take action before you can receive the financial rewards. Act now. Epilogue. How to pay for a child's college education for $7,000. As the book draws to a close and approaches publication, I would like to share a final thought with you. The main reason I wrote this book was to share insights into how increased financial intelligence can be used to solve many of life's common problems. Without financial training, we all too often use the standard formulas to get through life, such as to work hard, save, borrow and pay excessive taxes. Today we need better information. I use the following story as a final example of a financial problem that confronts many young families today. How do you afford a good education for your children and or children's college education? He was putting $300 away in a mutual fund each month and had so far accumulated about $12,000. He estimated he needed $400,000 to get four children through college. He had 12 years to save for it, since his oldest child was then six years of age. The year was 1991, and the real estate market in Phoenix was terrible. People were giving houses away. I suggested to my classmate that he buy a house with some of the money in his mutual fund. The idea intrigued him and we began to discuss the possibility. His primary concern was that he did not have the credit with the bank to buy another house, since he was so overextended. I assured him that there were other ways to finance a property other than through the bank. We looked for a house for two weeks, a house that would fit all the criteria we were looking for. There were a lot to choose from, so the shopping was kind of fun. Finally, we found a three-bedroom, two-bath home in a prime neighborhood. The owner had been downsized and needed to sell that day because he and his family were moving to California where another job waited. He wanted $102,000, but we offered only $79,000. He took it immediately. The home had on it what is called a non-qualifying loan, which means even a bum without a job could buy it without a banker's approval. The owner owed $72,000 so all my friend had to come up with was $7,000, the difference in price between what was owed and what it sold for. As soon as the owner moved, my friend put the house up for rent. After all expenses were paid, including the mortgage, he put about $125 in his pocket each month. His plan was to keep the house for 12 years and let the mortgage get paid down faster, by applying the extra $125 to the principal each month. We figured that in 12 years, a large portion of the mortgage would be paid off and he could possibly be clearing $800 a month by the time his first child went to college. He could also sell the house if it had appreciated in value. In 1994, the real estate market suddenly changed in Phoenix and he was offered $156,000 for the same house by the tenant who lived in it and loved it. Again, he asked me what I thought, 
and I naturally said sail, on a 1031 tax deferred exchange. Suddenly, he had nearly $80,000 to operate with. I called another friend in Austin, Texas who then moved this tax deferred money into a mini storage facility. Within three months, he began receiving checks for a little less than a $1,000 a month in income which he then poured back into the college mutual fund that was now building much faster. In 1996, the mini warehouse sold and he received a check for nearly $330,000 as proceeds from the sale which was again rolled into a new project that would now throw off over $3,000 a month in income, again, going into the college mutual fund. He is now very confident that his goal of $400,000 will be met easily, and it only took $7,000 to start and a little financial intelligence. His children will be able to afford the education that they want and he will then use the underlying asset, wrapped in his C-corporation, to pay for his retirement. As a result of this successful investment strategy he will be able to retire early. Thank you for reading this book. I hope it has provided some insights into utilizing the power of money to work for you. Today, we need greater financial intelligence to simply survive. The idea that it takes money to make money is the thinking of financially unsophisticated people. It does not mean that they are not intelligent. They have simply not learned the science of making money. Money is only an idea. If you want more money simply change your thinking. Every self-made person started small with an idea, then turned it into something big. The same applies with investing. It takes only a few dollars to start and grow it into something big. I meet so many people who spend their lives chasing the big deal, or trying to mass a lot of money to get into a big deal, but to me that is foolish. Too often I have seen unsophisticated investors put their large nest egg into one deal and lose most of it rapidly. They may have been good workers, but they were not good investors. Education and wisdom about money are important. Start early. Buy a book. Go to a seminar. Practice. Start small. I turned $5,000 cash into a $1 million dollar asset producing $5,000 a month cash flow in less than 6 years. But I started learning as a kid. I encourage you to learn because it's not that hard. In fact, it's kind of easy once you get the hang of it. I think I have made my message clear. It's what is in your head that determines what is in your hands. Money is only an idea. There is a great book called Think and Grow Rich. The title is not Work Hard and Grow Rich. Learn to have money work hard for you and your life will be easier and happier. Today, don't play it safe, play it smart. Take action. Many of you were given two great gifts, your mind and your time. It is up to you to do what you please with both. With each dollar bill that enters your hand, you and only you have the power to determine your destiny. Spend it foolishly, you choose to be poor. Spend it on liabilities, you join the middle class. Invest it in your mind and learn how to acquire assets and you will be choosing wealth as your goal and your future. The choice is yours and only yours. Every day with every dollar, you decide to be rich, poor or middle class. Choose to share this knowledge with your children, and you choose to prepare them for the world that awaits. No one else will. You and your children's future will be determined by choices you make today, not tomorrow. We wish you great wealth and much happiness with this fabulous gift called life. Hazur Dhanyabad Sir, Azako, Atharong, Atharong episode मैं फुगे कह सकूँ आई रहा आज आपको एपिसोड पनी सकिए कुछ है और हज़रत ला जानकारी देना चाहें सो कि अब आपको भूली यो इंग्लिश बात है सकिए सर पर्सी बात है चाहें हम ले नेपाली में हम इस हल फॉल करने सो पहला हम ले इंग्लिश में सकिए को बोलो हियर वी आर ओवर टुडेज प्रोग्राम लर्निंग एंड लिसनिंग प्रोग्राम uh, from the Roberto uh, Kiyosaki uh, so we are um, going to move now in a regular program abo hami regular program ma aundai chhau ra kehi ber pachi aune chhau tesma bhane hajur sabai le sahbhagita janaunu na adro chha hai ta good bye good night take care a little bit ek minute ma farkinai ta